Director of the National Marine Protected Area Center, and with me today is uh, Professor Dan LaFoley, who is the Vice Chair of the World Commission on Protected Areas for Marine. And we're very pleased to be sharing with you these uh, takeaways from the World Conservation Congress, particularly as they relate to oceans. And I'm going to pass along the regrets from Carl London, who, from IUCN's Marine and Polar Program. Carl was going to be with us, but he unfortunately is in the air right now and couldn't join us today. So Dan and I are going to be presenting this, and we also have um, Sarah Carr from EBM Tools Network, who's going to be moderating the questions for us. Thanks, Sarah. And as always, we thank EBM Tools Network and Open Channels as our um, collaborators on this webinar series. So as you know, uh, there will be plenty of time for questions and answers at the end of this webinar, so we encourage you to go ahead and fill out the question form, and we'll be getting to those later in the talk. Um, so we look forward to having that discussion with you. And I will just say that we were uh, inspired to do this talk because we knew how intense and overwhelming these big meetings can be, and, and it's such a great opportunity to hear uh, a combined view on the many things that are happening there. And we also thought that uh, the earlier speakers this summer who reported out on the International Coral Reef Symposium did such a great job with that, that we really liked this format in terms of reporting out on some of these big meetings. So welcome your feedback on, on whether you find this useful and uh, others that you'd like to see in the future. So when we talk about the World Conservation Congress, one of the important places to start was the announcement that the president made uh, expanding Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. This was the news that dominated the Congress. It was a great way to kick things off. And here you'll see a picture of the president with the Fish and Wildlife Superintendent of Papahanaumokuakea, Matt Brown, uh, out in the monument. Uh, it's such an amazing opportunity to have the president out in one of our marine protected areas and really experiencing the environment and understanding the issues that are going on out there. And this was uh, just the first of a, a really a month of ocean issues in the United States. Uh, World Conservation Congress was followed shortly thereafter by Our Oceans Congress, uh, sorry, Our Oceans Conference, uh, sponsored by the U.S. State Department. And so there's also a lot of great information about um, MPA news coming out of that meeting as well, and we can pass on some resources to you at the end of this webinar. So as I mentioned, um, it was big news. Social media was a great tool at the Congress for reaching out to people who could not be in Hawaii. Um, I don't have statistics for all of the Congress, but um, just for NOAA, the reach was quite tremendous. We had um, live streamed videos that were viewed over 30,000 times, and we had tweets that were tweeted and had an impression of over uh, 300,000 impressions. So a great way to reach out and connect with sort of the broader conservation community. And of course, the expansion of Papahanaumokuakea really changed the landscape of protection in the U.S. It is the largest protected area of any kind, whether on land or sea in the world, increasing from 360,000 uh, square kilometers to 1.5 million square kilometers. So uh, a huge increase. And for the U.S., what this means is that the coverage of marine protected areas went from 13% of U.S. waters to 26% of U.S. waters. And those are marine protected areas that are focused on ecosystem protection and biological diversity and cultural resource management. And of course, it was cause for celebration, and so uh, that was one of the great things about WCC. There were a lot of meetings and products and things that you're going to be hearing about, but you know, very importantly, it was a chance to connect with friends and colleagues and to um, you know, really have a chance to celebrate some of our conservation accomplishments. And I should note that you know, these celebrations weren't limited to any one group. This was something that that happened because of the concerted effort of a lot of different people who were involved. Um, in the case of the Papahana expansion, uh, it included NGOs, Native Hawaiian groups, uh, state government, and of course the White House. Another big theme at the World Conservation Congress was the integration of nature and culture. Um, often these uh, 
these types of values are managed separately by separate organizations who don't always talk to each other. And so going into this Congress, it was the goal to try to bring these ideas together. And of course, that is something that is very integral to Hawaiian culture. So it's a perfect place to have that experience and that model of what it means to live harmoniously with both nature and culture as, as one. And uh, that included really reaching out to and including indigenous communities who can provide their traditional knowledge in managing places. Uh, indigenous peoples live on lands and waters that contain 80% of the world's biodiversity, and their cultures are based on that environment, and that's certainly the case in Hawaii. And so that was a, that was a very important theme here. And of course, we're not just talking about um, talks. As I said, there was there was a lot of celebration. If you wanted to know where the party was, it was at the Pacific Islands Pavilion. They really <laughs> had a lot happening there, and it was was great in the evenings. Uh, these events uh, would go on all day long, and every evening there were social events and celebrations, and a chance to um, to really enjoy the music and dance. There was also an opportunity to celebrate marine world heritage sites. Um, Papahanaumokuakea is the um, first U.S. site to be inscribed for both natural and cultural resources. And so it was um, a great place to recognize the role of marine world heritage. These are students from uh, Native Hawaiian students who came over and performed a chant and a dance to welcome others. Uh, who are representing marine world heritage to the ocean pavilion. So, and uh, the marine world heritage sites around the world had just met previous to this meeting in the Galapagos, and then were bringing uh, their ideas from that meeting to this one. So, an, again, another opportunity that the Congress provided was a chance to um, convene people who were wanted to have side meetings or other gatherings to, to tag on to this one. I mentioned indigenous representatives and how important that was. Uh, this is a speaker from uh, Easter Island of Rapa Nui who had come to be part of a delegation to explore with uh, some of the staff from Papahanaumokuakea the linkages between uh, the, the Polynesian islands, that, including Rapa Nui and Hawaii, and their, their linkages of culture, of language, of history. And they were really pleased to have an opportunity to, to talk with uh, folks in Hawaii, and I think vice versa. So the beginning of a, a good friendship and discussion about potential future collaboration. Uh, there was a lot of ocean leadership there. You have here Sylvia Earle and Nainoa Thompson, both ocean elders and leaders in the ocean community. So there were a lot of high-level discussions. Uh, recognizing some of the issues that are going on in the marine community. Um, and uh, in addition to, to these two, there were other scientists, explorers, celebrities, activists who were part of the discussion, including people like uh, Thomas Friedman from the New York Times and E.O. Wilson. One of the big themes of the meeting was, was nature for all. This is something that came out of the World Parks Congress, the idea that we need to make nature relevant to everybody, not just to the true believers who, who already understand why nature is so important, and to encourage people to enjoy and connect with nature in a variety of ways. And so um, there was a real emphasis on youth and on engaging. Um, this is the Nature for All Pavilion. It was a great place for conversations. A uh, lot of young professional engagement through this, through this Congress. And just, uh, like I said, opportunities for people to have these informal conversations as well as these formal meetings. So now we are at the Ocean Pavilion, and I'm going to turn it over to Dan to take on this part. OK, thanks so much indeed, Lauren. So I think it's probably a, it's almost a tradition at parks congresses and um, conservation congresses that we will have an ocean pavilion. Uh, in Hawaii, it was the, uh, the, the, the largest pavilion we've had. It, its theme was uh, oceans and islands, and I think it was almost second only to the US pavilion in terms of area. Um, had a tremendous area for bringing people together and focal points also for um, work that has been done across the overseas territories of Europe and also part of it was a uh, 
a major area uh, where we hosted Google and um, uh, Google uh, presentations both covering uh, land and ocean. There was a lot of things going off uh, in terms of ocean activities. So as with previous major global events, we produced and published a, uh, a marine journey to, to help people make sense of perhaps what at first sight might be a, a kind of bewildering array in terms of the scale of things. So this is what the, uh, the, the, the journey looks like in schematic. So there are about uh, 230 um, marine sessions uh, held over five days. And these were spread not just uh, in the pavilion, but also there were workshops, knowledge cafes, and posters. And for the journey itself, uh, we created some, um, some thematic uh, journeys within it, five thematic journeys. So you could follow the blue economy, or youth and young professionals, pollution species, and, and blue solutions. One of the things which was perhaps a major difference from previous con congresses was the scale of public access. So part of the uh, decision in, in holding uh, the congress was that we would invite the public in and, and there were about 6,000 visitors over five days and, and one day actually dedicated to, to school visits, uh, bringing a lot of uh, local school children in to, uh, to engage in the different topics and issues that were the focus of the congress. It was also, uh, as ever, um, an unprecedented opportunity to bring uh, representatives from governments um, uh, and nations around the world together. We had something like 160 countries represented, uh, several heads of state, ministers and agency heads, and here we see uh, Dr. Catherine Sullivan from, from NOAA. Uh, a lot of active involvement in many sessions in many of the pavilions, which was a fantastic opportunity for direct interaction between uh, our leaders and uh, members of the conservation community worldwide. There were also some what I would call set pieces. So there was um, six high-level dialogues. Uh, one was on uh, actions for a sustainable ocean, but we also had uh, high-level dialogues on a, a changing climate, uh, championing nature-based solutions, private finance, empowering the next generation, ending wildlife trafficking and uh, spirituality and conservation. And I, I think what's really nice to see is the fact that, that oceans have come of age and uh, rather being sort of a, a subset of the discussions, we saw in Hawaii, ocean was really center stage in a lot of the things that happened at a, at a very high level stage in the process. And this was um, uh, a photo of the, the high level ocean uh, dialogue with um, various experts uh, answering questions, interacting and expressing opinions on ocean sustainability. We also had a number of what were uh, conservation cases. These were particular topics which had been highlighted and developed in the lead up to uh, Hawaii where there, there was facilitated dialogue of, on these topics of particular high interest and relevance. And there were, in fact, eight conservation cases. Uh, one was on the ocean, and this was capturing the issues about uh, the high seas and conserving Earth's final frontier. And these sat, sat alongside things like biodiversity offsets, where we had a conservation case, islands at risk, and things like nature-based solutions. So again, really fantastic to see. And what was particularly attractive, I think, was the fact that um, a really skilled artist was used to capture the, the, the spirit and nature and topics of the discussion, and this is the, uh, the caricaturing, if you like, um, of the, uh, the high seas. And if you, you look very carefully to the top left, you, you might just see an appalling caricature of myself. <laughs> it was also a time for informal meetings. So this is a real opportunity for people to get together. And I think it's not just so much about what was debated in the, the big main dialogues as as the, the important informal debates that took place. And this is just uh, um, in the, the Nature for All um, pavilion, just to demonstrate that even inside, it's possible to create a very safe campfire around which you can gather to mm -hmm. share stories and, uh, and, uh, and ideas and, uh, and opportunities. It was also a time when uh, countries came together. We see representatives here from US and uh, Chile planning uh, 
collaboration, but also it was a time when um, people came together to sign, sign agreements, and these may be high-level agreements between uh, IUCN and key partner organizations, or indeed agencies signing agreements, as is in the case on the, uh, on the right between uh, France and Chile. As ever, I think in our, in our increasingly digitized world, or digital world, this was where kind of information technology really came to the fore. It's probably never before in a Congress. So NOAA bought their science on a sphere uh, with perhaps dozens of global data sets where in this incredible technology they could uh, tell conservation stories. And many of these talks are actually in fact streamed live via Facebook to, to global audiences. We also see, saw NASA and others uh, playing roles in bringing new technologies. This is a presentation uh, by one of the NASA scientists looking at how we can actually use technology to remove the ripples of the sea surface so that we can produce perfect three-dimensional models of what lies beneath. And this may well be technology that we see rolled out as part of uh, global mapping in a few years' time. And it was also probably the first time that we saw so much virtual, um, virtual reality systems. Um, on the left-hand side is a virtual reality system where you could go for quite a breathtaking dive with Dr. Sylvia Earle in, in, in full HD, uh, high-definition, uh, 360 technology um, and dive and swim alongside her. Google also bought um, a lot of virtual reality to it. Uh, providing goggles uh, so that school children in particular, but it seemed like many of the experts and professionals were also taking advantage of this, could actually go on, uh, on expeditions um, uh, from the safety of the, uh, the Google area, uh, exploring the world around them in places that they would probably never otherwise be able to kind of experience in that way. And here we see uh, the, uh, the Google part of the Ocean Pavilion uh, crammed full of uh, school children on uh, on an, a, uh, a, an explorer student view expedition. So switching gears a bit to the sort of final part of the presentation, let's talk a bit about the outputs and products from the Conservation Congress. One of the, uh, the key ambitions we've had in WCPA Marine working with partners is to help the community publish a lot more and much more quickly in peer review. Uh, we have a, a special relationship with Wiley Blackwell, who published the high-impact uh, scientific publication, Aquatic Conservation. And we were pleased to, to bring some 260 pages of new science uh, from the World Parks Congress to launch into the World Conservation Congress. So this is about picking up the momentum, about working with many members and experts to be able to assist them in getting their story out uh, within a year or so into peer review so that we can then make sure that full advantage have taken of the, the new ideas and new theories which are presented at these global events. And indeed, we, we have one of these uh, publications in preparation underway, capturing some of the, the incredible science and stories from Hawaii, and that will be launched at Impact 4 in just under a year's time um, in Chile. It was a time of announcements. So, for example, the announcement by IUCN and Mission Blue uh, of a way of mobilizing public engagement with the ocean to enable people to propose places that they care about. And this was an opportunity to both launch the new online system for hope spots, as uh, Sylvia Earle calls them, and to, to show uh, and declare 14 new locations around the world where there is a procession of the public asking for the areas to be better cared for and protected. It was a time of launching uh, a lot more science. Uh, one of the, uh, the highest level um, uh, public events uh, worldwide from the Congress alongside uh, information about the Red List was about explaining um, about ocean warming a new publication we produced of 465 pages of new peer-reviewed information uh, from uh, 80 scientists working in 12 countries. Perhaps the most comprehensive study ever undertaken of what, what all that climate energy, some 93% of the warming energy since the 70s, has been doing to the ocean. 
I say this was uh, one of a number of high-level press events that were, were organized uh, around ocean issues at the Congress. And it really um, perhaps uh, added to the connection that we see increasingly see between uh, both conservation and climate now at a global arena scale um, from the uh, UNFCCC through to what we are doing uh, as IUCN. It was also a time to expose new ideas. So um, one of the new areas that, that was featured uh, in the discussions in Hawaii was about uh, other, uh, other effective uh, uh, conservation measures. And this is part of the, um, the, the target under the Convention on Biological Diversity. It's called HE Target 11, which, which has the 10% target in but it also talks about other effective area-based conservation measures. And IUCN is working with many partners to develop new guidance on this, which will be issued around Christmas 2017 to enable us to embrace many other ways in which conservation is delivered. The origin and the journey may be different, but the outcome may be very much the same. And so this is one of many technical sessions which were undertaken on ocean issues at the Congress. Alongside that was also working with many of the, the agencies looking at how we can consolidate progress on protected areas. Something which had been launched uh, at IMPACT 3, the International Marine Protected Area Network Agenda, is targeted at accelerating implementation of AG Target 11. This, this target under the Convention of Biological Diversity calling for 10% of uh, protection of the oceans by 2020. And this initiative is working in partnership with, the, with uh, 12 countries, with the agencies in 12 countries that are actually doing the delivery of marine protected areas. And, and part of this has been actually understanding what their needs are so that we can then look at how we can work alongside them to produce the information, uh, particularly in areas that are holding um, progress back. And so part of the analysis which was talked about there was looking at where the agencies are, are more confident or where they are less confident in implementing the targets under the Convention on Biological Diversity, particularly Target 11. And so we find when we look at the confidence that designating 10% is way up there, but when we start to get into integration, ecological representativity, and well-connected systems, there's less confidence, which should give some direction for the future about where the community should target some of its efforts to get more of its messaging and information out. A key part of these congresses is about resolutions. And I think it's important to understand what resolutions are. Resolutions are uh, the community coming together over particular topics. And they express the will of IUCM and members through a democratic voting process. And we have two major uh, resolutions on the oceans that came out of Hawaii. Um, but they, they need to be seen in the context of a greater concern from IUCN members that far more needs to be done across the board to stem the losses that we see in biodiversity worldwide, whether on land or in the ocean. The two key resolutions, one of them was on increasing the marine protected area coverage for effective marine biodiversity conservation. And this is really picking up from the, the process that the community went through at the World Parks Congress in Sydney in 2014, looking at where we need to be and what we need to do to, uh, to actually effectively um, address marine biodiversity conservation. So this is the resolution that talks about at least 30% of the ocean. As with both resolutions, this was, part, this was passed through an open voting process involving IUCN members and uh, many days of debate leading up to that. The second resolution uh, focused particularly on the ocean was on the conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. So this is part of the, the global process looking at how we've closed this gap, the, the last missing major frontier in conservation in the world where the high seas, the open ocean beyond the jurisdiction of individual countries lacks any sort of familiar conservation framework you, you may know on land. 
So this was very much putting into resolution, again, discussions that are ongoing and have been ongoing over many years, and indeed parallel a process that is now happening in the UN looking at the, uh, the, the concept of a new agreement between nations to protect things on uh, the open ocean in areas outside uh, national jurisdiction. And at that point, as we close, I'll, I'll, I'll pan back to Lauren to perhaps wrap up talking more generally about the commitments coming out of Hawaii and take home messages. Thanks. So Dan talked about the motions that came out of the voting process. And another way in which the delegates kind of expressed their sense of the issues and the way forward was through this document called the Hawaii Commitments. And we can provide you some links, but all of this is online if you're interested. And so the Hawaii Commitment is a short document, it's about four pages long, that just lays out what some of the critical issues are and, and some of the issues going forward. And I think one of the things that's notable about it is that in a Congress um, of people representing all interests, oceans consistently rose to, uh, to one of the highest levels in terms of concern and awareness that people wanted to raise. So in terms of framing the critical issues going forward, the Hawaii Commitments talk about the nexus between biological and cultural diversity. We talked about that earlier, the idea of, of integrating these, these two ideas um, and recognizing the importance of traditional wisdom and modern knowledge. The second critical issue being the significance of the world's oceans for biological biodiversity conservation and sustainable livelihoods. And the third being the threat to biodiversity from habitat loss climate change, invasive species, unsustainable exploitation and pollution. So the whole scope of threat to biodiversity. But you'll see that in framing three critical issues, the ocean was listed as one. And then in terms of opportunities going forward, um, again, the ocean rises to the top and, and uh, is noted in terms of preserving the health of the world ocean, along with some other topics that, that were discussed I thought one of the most interesting ones was the idea of linking spirituality, religion, and culture. There was a high-level dialogue on this subject, and uh, people from different religious backgrounds um, really discussing their attitudes and their traditions of caring for the earth, and, and the level in w which they had these ideas in common was really inspiring. So now we're going to talk about um, the takeaway messages, these are, of course, subjective. As you saw, there was so much going on that there was no possible way to, to attend uh, even a small fraction of all these sessions on the ocean. But these are some things that bubbled up to the top that we wanted to, to highlight. Um, the first, I think, is that there are widespread and rapid effects of climate change. You heard about the ocean warming report, but there was also a lot of other concern about climate change and noting that these impacts are not evenly distributed around the globe and that areas like the Arctic are experiencing you know, disproportionate impacts. The second being that um, MPAs are an important tool for climate resilience. This is something that the president said in, in designating Papahanaumokuakea, the expansion area, and uh, subsequently in, in designating another monument in the Atlantic uh, just a couple of weeks later that MPAs can really help provide a, a refuge and an opportunity to, uh, to buffer climate impacts. So the third uh, message uh, was the increase in the number of very large-scale MPAs and the need for tailored management guidance and also management resources for these areas. Um, this, again, got a lot of attention because we were in the Pacific, which is the place that a lot of these large-scale MPAs exist. Um, a great community of practice, Big Ocean, which is putting together guidance for large-scale MPAs that will be published very soon, and I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that. Um, I mentioned previously the integration of nature and culture and the, the push to, to get people to not think of these as separate, but to really take a page from the uh, indigenous cultures and the, and the example of Hawaii and think of them as, as one. Uh, the other was the recognition that 10% ocean goal that we have in the Aichi Target 11 is not enough. Um, and there was enough consensus on this issue to pass that resolution calling for a new target of 30%. But on the flip side of the, of the spatial coverage is that spatial coverage itself is not enough. And this, this comes out again in, in Dan's 
uh, review of what the agencies are saying about where they stand with respect to spatial targets, that they're making good progress on the coverage, but some of the real challenges are on those issues of connectivity and, and strong management. And then just to continue on the take-home messages, um, we heard a lot about the evaluation and use of innovative tools for management, uh, including enforcement technology. This is an area that's moving really rapidly, and there was a um, half-day conservation campus session just focused on enforcement technology. Um, there was an, an increasing focus on the role of other measures in contributing to MPA networks. So again, looking at the whole suite of tools that are area-based that can contribute to conservation outcomes, not only at marine protected areas. Um, the need for and use of people networks for managers to share information and tools. Um, there was a terrific session in the Ocean Pavilion of MPA networks from around the world all coming together and sharing the kind of work that they've been doing and, and uh, establishing ways to keep that dialogue going after the Congress. Um, the need to support the next generation in building long-term capacity to manage MPAs. So when we talk about reaching out to youth, we're not just talking about um, school children, but we're also talking about really providing opportunities and career paths for young professionals. And then Finally, uh, this increasing focus on the high seas, which I think, you know, several years ago had been kind of considered to be out of our jurisdiction and out of our hands and maybe too big to manage, um, has really come into its own and been a real focus for uh, figuring out how we can apply some management tools that we have now to these areas, including governance tools and being innovative about how we think about these areas outside national jurisdiction. So uh, we just wanted to pass on a couple of resources to you. There's uh, the main page for our ocean, uh, the, the State Department conference I mentioned that followed the World Conservation Congress, and then, of course, the WCC page. And here you have our uh, email addresses as well. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't also put in a plug looking forward as, as we set out to sail with this BACA here. Um, in thinking about the International MPA Congress, Impact 4, that's going to be held next September in Chile. And we really want to thank the Chilean government for their leadership in stepping up and taking on uh, this important conference, which is only held every three or four years. And it's going to be a great opportunity for the MPA community to come together and really keep this momentum and this dialogue going. So we hope uh, to be reporting out from Impact 4 and also to be seeing many of you there. So I think we're going to stop there. Hawaii was um, was going to be buffered by two hurricanes when we were there, and they, they bypassed the island of Oahu, but we did get lots of changeable weather and rainbows, and this rainbow happens to be hitting exactly over the convention center. So we thought it must be a sign. <laughs> so thanks, everyone. Okay. And this is Sarah Carr. I'm going to be helping with the moderation. Um, uh, thank you so much for Dan. Great photography, uh, you guys. So it's great that you were able to do all that while also presenting and uh, holding meetings. Um, so I wanted to let everyone know we have plenty of time for questions. So if you have questions for Lauren and Dan, go ahead and type them into the question panel now, um, and they can answer them. And Let's see, there was just one so far. Um, is it possible to get a closer look at or an electronic copy of the Marine Journey Event Guide? I think it's, uh, it's available online. Um, what we can do is uh, perhaps circulate a link to it. Sure, we can put it in, in the resources. Yeah, we'll put, it down, we'll put a link to in, in, uh, in the resources page. Okay, and now the question. Just, oh, Sarah, I was just gonna add that yep. uh, the uh, the World Conservation Congress page also has a lot of uh, recordings of some of the sessions. So if anyone is interested in particular, especially the high-level sessions, many of them were recorded. There's, there's a lot more information for this Congress than, than has ever been available um, for previous Congresses. So um, so to drill down into what, what is available on the, uh, on the web, uh, it's, I think some tremendous resources there. Okay, got it. Okay. And now we have uh, about four questions. Um, can you provide examples of innovative marine protection tools in addition to MPAs? 
answer you on that? Uh, I think what they mean is the other measures. Yeah, so so yeah. perhaps I should. Yeah, I'll say a little bit about that. So, so this is something that um, uh, the World Commission on Protected Areas, who advised the CBD on protected areas, was asked to do by the Convention on Biological Diversity, and this is you know the guidance which will be launched in uh, Christmas. Uh, 2017 and so this is to to look at the types of things that could um, uh, both on land and sea so it will be one set of guidance uh, qualify under other effective area-based measures and so what we're doing at the moment is producing that guidance and we're actually in the process of trying to collect together case studies of things that that probably fall within that area. There's many, there's many things that are, are area-based that may not contribute, but there are certainly some that would contribute. And to give you an example, um, for, for example, in some places of the world, we've protected fairly large, in terms of uh, kilometers worth of ocean, uh, for um, war graves and uh, protected wrecks, where it's, it's not conceivable you would go and disturb these areas, and yet uh, people can go and visit them and dive, and they have an increased biodiversity. They have a governance around them. Uh, it is about in situ conservation. It is about long term. And so potentially those types of areas could be looked at um, and, and be embraced as uh, helping to deliver conservation. Um, it is also, though, about, not about areas that, that don't have any government framework around them. So areas alongside pipelines or something like that, that they may, maybe ch have a changed purpose from year to year. They, they, can, they can have their purpose altered without any real long-term intent uh, are not the sorts of things which would probably qualify under this. So we are at the, the very sort of stage of working this out, and we have a task force involving around, uh, I think, 100 people now uh, starting to look at this issue with initial guidance being drafted by uh, Christmas this year. That guidance will then be uh, tested uh, both in terrestrial and marine situations in the spring next year to refine this information. At the heart of this guidance is likely to be a three-step tool uh, to help you try and work out whether what you have uh, does fall within this remit of other effective area-based uh, measures. Um, and, and so that's kind of where we're at at the moment. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Lauren. Um, let's see. Was there much discussion on the value of establishing MPAs in the context of marine spatial planning processes? Yeah, so I think this is actually at the heart of the, the issue we stand at, which is the fact that we do need to, the, I think there was a fair amount of discussion about this, but in, in from a variety of different um, uh, pers perspectives, if I can call it that, not just kind of marine spatial planning, but but very much issues. There was, for example, a workshop uh, around the whole issue of connectivity. Um, I think it was almost a day's workshop on that. And so there, there is a real issue here, and you can see it reflected in the in the views of the implementing agencies about about how we connect together with the broader broader ocean landscape. And I think there is a, a real job to be done by the community to, to not only acknowledge that we need to do this, but to perhaps um, accept that we're going to have to learn through doing and produce some rules of thumb. You know, I, my view is that 70% is better than no percent. And whilst we do make progress on this, I think there's more that we could do. So yes, it was discussed, but I think it is, it is one of those kind of areas that has been signaled that we, we still need to do more to make sure we, we get better integration. After all, we kind of don't want to create a future where we create isolated marine protected areas or islands of hope, as I call them, in perhaps a sea of despair. So we, we know what we need to do, and probably this is the moment as we look towards Impact 4 to embrace some of those, those things like how we integrate with marine spatial planning as key topics as we move forward. Okay, um, let's see, really good questions. Uh, okay, um, when the High Seas Agreement on Marine Environment Conservation is completed by the Department of Ocean Affairs at the UN Law of the Sea with a treaty in 2019 or before, what in your view will the hypothetical institutional structure 
financing model and monitoring and enforcement process for high seas marine protected areas in the high seas look like? Well, I, I would actually say that that's, that's a question which is above my pay grade as vice chair. That is precisely the, the prep com process that we have running. Um, so we have something called the preparatory um, process which is running. And uh, I can't tell you the answer for that because that is going to be the decision of um, the, the UN nations that are, that are responsible for the law of the sea. And that is where the implementing agreement is being discussed. All I can say at the moment is that those discussions are ongoing. I do think they have the right focus. It's not just about marine protected areas. It's all about also about having the right processes for assessment uh, as activities move forward out there. But I, I, I probably can't tell you uh, what that will look like in detail. But what I do know is that what we do need to head towards is equivalent processes that, that operate perhaps in sympathy with some of the ways in which we've, we've viewed things out there, but nevertheless with a sharp enough edge so that we can get ahead of the, the curve, if I can call it that, of, of concerns over, of, over degradation and, uh, and loss of biodiversity out there. Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, let's see, did China or Russia have any representatives there? So I, I can't speak for China, but certainly I had very good discussions with the Russians. Uh, the Russians actually had an entire pavilion, and the Russians actually have uh, a major celebration of conservation happening in Sochi next year, uh, where we're going to be looking to make some uh, input and support and assist them with that. So, um, so I, I say it, it, it's probably because I was in sessions the whole time, and one day I spent five and a half hours on panels. Um, so actually getting around to meet lots of people was a challenge. So I can't say from the Chinese side, but certainly uh, the engagement with the Russians was fantastic. And China was present, but again, I, I don't have any detailed knowledge of what their role was or what they uh, had to say about ocean issues. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, as an ocean educa educator for a natural history museum, are there key messages you think are important to communicate to our visitors, the general public? Should we be recommending any actions? I think the short answer is yes. Um, and there are some great work that I'm sure you're aware of on ocean literacy, just kind of basic understanding of how the world's oceans work, you know, the idea that we have one global ocean and that it's being affected by human activities, um, those sort of broad messages. And then as we get into um, some of these conservation issues, the idea that climate change is happening now, that it is having uh, systemic effects on the world's oceans is going to be affecting us, uh, that ocean acidification is happening now and is also going to be affecting food chains in the oceans. So I think, you know, um, many of these topics are really important to get out to the public. But I, at the same time, and I think the Natural History Museum has done a really good job in this respect, not to overwhelm people with bad news, but to talk about what is being done to address these issues and ways forward. Okay. All right. Thank you, Lauren. Um, with the inertia for designation of additional extents of protected area, discussion of implementation seems muted. What is the current dialogue for regulation and enforcement of high seas areas? And can you speak to funded, implemented approaches for managing and governing from the newly designated large-scale areas in the U.S. and elsewhere, elsewhere outside of Coral Triangle areas? Well, I'll start, and then I think Dan probably has some things to add. Um, I, again, I'm not going to venture into the high seas, but I will say that, that enforcement was a big topic. Um, there was a, a whole workshop focused on it and, and very well attended with a lot of uh, Enforcement officials from around the world, Interpol, people who are dealing with these issues in a hands-on way, day to day at their sites. So I think that was that was very helpful, and and perhaps we could actually encourage them to do a webinar because I think a lot of people had a strong interest in the enforcement issues. Um, and and then as far as the implementation of some of these large areas, I think you've put your finger on a, a really important topic. I mean, uh, obviously it takes resources to to manage these MPAs. There was a lot of focus on sustainable financing at this meeting. There was a lot of discussion about partnerships and bringing in people with different capacities to help uh, pull 
pull different components of MPA management together. But I, I think the short answer is this is going to be an ongoing process, and you're going to be seeing more about it as uh, as management plans get updated with some of these new areas. Yeah, and perhaps I, I'll, I'll add in a few things. So, so in terms of the the, the whole issue of enforcement, I, I, you know, we increasingly see a lot of visibility around new technology tools from the likes of Pew, um, Oceana, Google, uh, SkyTruth that enables us to see where the fishing boats are. I think you know now is the moment that we actually need to mainstream these and make them much more widely available um, and and look at how they can then be used to track and prosecute. Um, uh, the 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 small you know smaller number of offenders in the process. I think we also uh, had quite a lot of discussions around uh, management effectiveness, both from uh, the land and also in the ocean. Uh, there's initiatives such as the Green List. We we have a working group there um, uh, for marine chaired by Sue Wells, where we're looking to make sure that the the development of of, of how we we work with countries to, to increase the effectiveness of their protected areas, takes full accounts of marine. Um, and there's also things like the management effectiveness tracker, the MET tool and things like that, where just yesterday a new report was uh, released on that. And I think the ocean community has, has a load of work to do on that, actually. Um, uh, a fair number of sites have been looked at on land, and I think we, we need to, to come together as a community more on dealing with these things. And then finally, over the the very large marine protected areas. Uh, we have a tremendous task force who are working on developing guidance, uh, which will be, I think, available shortly, that will actually try and bring together some of these issues um, to help people understand uh, how we make sure that these um, are, are real places with real management in place and how we embrace that. And we, we work across the community to have sites supporting each other in how they take these things forward. Okay. All right. Thank you, Lauren and Dan. Uh, let's see. Any thoughts or recommendations for about or for business and its constructive roles in MPAs and areas beyond national jurisdiction, et cetera, for conservation and sustainable use of, of oceans? Well, again, I have one comment, and I think Dan probably does too. I think there's a tremendous role for business, and you know there definitely was some good business representation at this meeting. I think it could be better. Um, one of the one of the panels that I participated in was on ocean plastics, and we talked a lot about the idea of starting at the source, you know, of redesigning business processes, and uh, you know, creating new products that that have far less waste. So I think as we start to think about the fundamental drivers of some of the impacts to the ocean, business is going to be a key player, and we absolutely need to get them more engaged. I think we also need to, to think uh, as a community about how we, we, we embrace business. So we have all, always on the marine side tried to be ahead of the curve and tried to, to uh, kind of carve new routes, including bringing in Google, for example, very early on so that Everyone in the world now, when they do a map search, sees a three-dimensional ocean. But I think one of the comments, which was very telling, um, uh, despite the fact that we had a business and biodiversity pavilion, one of the comments made to me in that pavilion, which I think was very telling, was that someone who didn't know much about us came into the Congress and said, well, where are all the businesses? You know, it was, it was all conservation focused. And, I, and yes, perhaps it should be, but I do think we need, as a community, to, to to evolve and mature our views about how we, we embrace these things, not to dilute our, our, our ethics approach or, or our drive, but to think how we engage in that way. And there are, there are a lot of discussions and deals being done uh, with business, some in very specific arenas in terms of how um, business can work together, ocean business, to, to help monitor um, uh, not just things like um, uh, fishing vessels, but actually the ocean health itself. And I think there's more, much more work to be done. There's a massive potential there, but it is perhaps ultimately about how we speak the same language, how we, we, we create that dialogue, which I, I still think we need to do more of. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, what insights about ocean plastics came out of the conference? Um, Lauren, you mentioned one about stopping at, uh, stopping ocean plastics at the source. Were there any other ocean plastics insights? Well, there were. Um, 
I think, that, as you've probably seen on the media, there was a lot of interest in microplastics and microfibers. Um, this is a, a relatively new area that people are starting to understand a lot better about the, um, the, the sort of pervasive impact of um, shedding from our clothing and you know fibers that, that all these high-tech fabrics that we thought were so great turn out to have a downside. So that was definitely one topic. Um, and there was there was a good debate about the role of regulation versus innovation. How much do you try to work with business and redesign processes, and how much do you simply tell people, you know, we are not going to have single-use cups and, and um, cutlery, which France just did. Um, so, uh, you know, I think there wasn't, uh, there's not one path forward. There's definitely going to be, need to be multiple approaches, but I think what I took away was that plastics is just a, a pervasive problem that spans the entire globe and needs to be looked at that way. And I would just add, okay. I, I heard I heard someone describe the term plastic footprint, which I had not heard before, and I thought maybe that's a good outreach tool that we need to get people to start thinking about their plastic footprint. Interesting. All right. Thank you, Lauren. Um, and also, well, there was also a question, uh, were there any um, insights about invasive species management that came out of the conference? You know, there was talk about invasive species, but I think Dan and I were uh, were not at those sessions, so I can't give you any specifics. I I know that okay. there was talk about lionfish and some other invasives. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, and let's see, we have a couple about um, involving fishermen. Um, how would you? Uh, advise communicating or involving fishermen or others who may be opposed to the idea of marine protected areas? Well, I think part of the power of the resolution process is the community coming together to get its views clear on uh, how they see the future so that we, we can speak uh, with a, a voice over the needs for the future. I think then it is, it is a little bit more than we've been doing in terms of the conversation. So one of the things that we keep engaging uh, with the fisheries sector over is the targets under what's called HE Target 11, which is the key target under the Convention on Biological Diversity. So how many of you know about the target for sustainable fishing under Target 6? So what we tend to do is have this discussion engaging with the fishing community over uh, the level of protection, but, but also under the same set of targets that we operate under, is a target which looks at the sustainability of fishing and perhaps we should do more to celebrate the fishing efforts under that target as well as what we're trying to do under target 11. So I think it is about um, uh, having a broader conversation. I think it is about uh, recognizing the ways in which uh, other measures that the fishing industry are taking can be, can be better reflected and uh, better celebrated uh, as part of an overall process. And I would add, Jan's been talking at the global scale, and you can scale it down to the site level, that when you're talking about establishing or managing a marine protected area, I think one of the things we have clearly learned from our social scientists is that if you don't have public support for an area, it will not succeed. And so there needs to be um, public participation. There needs to be uh, an equitable approach to these areas. It needs to respect the rights of indigenous people. And, uh, you know, we need to, we're learning these lessons. I think in a lot of places there have been excellent lessons learned and they're being applied in a lot of places. So we just need to continue to kind of uh, draw on that toolbox. Okay, thank you. Um, so this may be our last question. Let's see. Was there much interest in using MPAs to conserve deep sea habitats within or beyond national jurisdictions that are increasingly threatened by mining, fishing, and other human uses? So I think one of the big things that we saw, which was uh, mentioned at the Congress and had been launched just before the Congress, was the recognition by, the, uh, uh, by UNESCO of the need to, to look beyond national jurisdiction to protect areas of uh, outstanding universal value. Um, so this is the, the kind of issue that unless we do this, we might rename the convention half the World Heritage Convention because it isn't applying consistently. And one of the, I'd say one of the big changes alongside the, the whole issue of, of a lot of discussion around, you know, what should a high seas agreement look like, 
um, and I, I mentioned, for example, the, 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 the conservation case we had on that, was the fact that there is a move to say, well, you know, the time is now that we need to actually realize there are places out there that do need protecting. And indeed, in the report that um, was talked about at the Congress um, from uh, UNESCO Marine World Heritage, it does identify a number of areas that could be of outstanding universal value, uh, including places that are so unusual that they are actually the, the focus for where NASA is looking for the analogs for, for life they may find on other places in the universe like Europa. And if, I, if that is an outstanding universal value and something worth looking at, then I don't know what is. And when you say universal, you mean universal. I mean universal. <laughs> but I think that, so the point is, yeah, that absolutely. But I think if we're looking at where, if I can call it the next low-hanging fruit lies in terms of uh, what we must do, it is actually work together to, to, to paint a broader canvas uh, with more examples of what there is out there that is so important that needs protecting. So taking the science and putting it into that communication piece we were talking about earlier and getting it out there in the museums and, and other places around the world is critical to show that the debate we're having on, on, on places like the high seas is not hypothetical, is not theoretical. These are places that should be looked after, should be protected, and we, frankly, we should have done it years ago. And NOAA's Office of Exploration and Research gave a great presentation at the U.S. Pavilion on ocean exploration, and they have just done a great job not only in exploring some of these places, but in doing that connection to people and having telepresence so people can get excited about what's on the bottom of the ocean as they see it for the first time. And so um, they announced their exploration season for the coming year and talked about the work they're going to be doing in the Pacific. A lot of it is in the U.S. EEZ, but some of it is outside. And, you know, it is a good opportunity to work with other partners and with folks who are trying to protect the high seas. Okay. Thank you, guys. That's great. Um, do we want to tackle one more? Let's sure, we could do oh, one last ahead. one. One last one. Okay. Uh, the Arctic Council is meeting here in Portland, Maine this week. The council approach differs from a UN board. In addition to the goal of designating 10% of the Arctic as protected, the council is moving towards making policy. Are there other examples of many nations, eight in this case, establishing regulations on waters that none of them own? Well, there certainly has been collaboration with other countries uh, in high seas areas. Mm. So in that sense, yes, there's precedent for it. Mm. Um, and one example is, is the management of the Central Arctic Ocean, which is currently being done through a, um, a voluntary fisheries closure, which several countries have agreed to, and, and the U.S. is now interested in expanding the number of countries who have agreed to that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you both so much. There were there were several other questions which were very good, which we were not able to get to, unfortunately. But uh, there was great was a great topic. We're so glad to learn more about the Congress, and a great question and answer at the end. So we very much appreciate your time for doing this, Dan and Lauren. Well, thanks very much, Sarah. Pleasure. Thanks for inviting us. Okay. And we hope okay. everyone can join us in webinars. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Hi, everyone.